Two, this is one. Radio check on uniform. How copy? Two, how you Lima Charlie? Uh, awesome. Let's get the gate us up at two seven zero point one. Also, Ops is going to be calling ahead to tower for us when we step. So don't bother calling for startup anymore. Uh, after you've got the gate, get the HQ up and contact me on three two point five. Oh, and one last thing to remember: you've got all the frequencies noted down on your keyboard. So if it's out, make sure you check there. Okay. Roger, Wilco. Check Fox Mike. I get you five by five, Kermit. Hey, while we're at it, let's see if Victor works fine. Push one two four point six, and let me know once you're there. Pushing one two four point six.
Pull up, pull up. Altitude, altitude.
Kermit, you're going to leave this one again. I'm going to be doing a lot of navigation and stuff on this sortie, so I'm going to stick it behind you and just watch how you're doing. Cool? Roger that. Great, go ahead and taxi to the active as instructed, and I'll follow you out. Solid copy. One, taxi out. Looks like those Eagles are getting ready for a pretty big mission. Yep. I assume if we go back to the Persian Gulf, the Eagles are going to be one of the first aircraft in right behind seed after they clear a path. More than likely, they're going to be hitting command center, staging areas, and supply lines. 
just like they did in Iraq. But if I remember correctly, back then they were just entering service. They didn't even have targeting pods installed on all the jets. They dropped a lot of Mark 82s under a constant hail of enemy AAA. I read a few books and everyone was amazed about the sheer volume of what Saddam had on the ground. Yeah, let's trial by fire for the F-15E and her crews. Some of their missions were pretty hairy, others weren't so bad. This time will be different though if we go back to that side of the world. Both sides will be using a lot more precision guided munitions like paveways and J-dams. That is, until it's safe enough to get low and dirty with the gun. In a conflict like this, our enemy is going to be better equipped and prepared, unlike what we're seeing in OEF and OIF. Raj, so much for the you don't need the oxygen mask part. Devil 1 2, contact tower at 327.7. Roger, contact the tower at 327.7. Okay, we're coming up to Alpha, push 327.7, uh, past 03 right, stop short of 03 left at the hold line, and let me know when you're ready for takeoff. I'll contact tower. Dallas Tower, double one flight, holding short, 403 left, ready for departure. Double one, Dallas Tower, winds are 028 for 10, cleared for takeoff runway 03 left, please expedite your departure. Clear for takeoff runway 03 left, and we'll hurry it up for you, double one. Alright, currently go ahead and enter the active, and without stopping, get lined up and feed the power in and take off. Watch the instruments and reject the takeoff if you need to. I'll be a few seconds behind you. Raj. One, holding short, zero three left, and up on tower. One rolling. One gear up.
one known as tower, contact departure 385.4 Alpha Mike. Level one copy is contacting departure at 385.4 today. Okay, Kermit, push no departure on uniform. I know it's a lot of jumping between different freaks. Perhaps we should go over using preset channels in one of the upcoming sorties. That sounds handy. Okay, let me know when you have your uniform up on departure. One is ready. Departure is set on uniform. No departure. Level one flight is with you over Apex, climbing for 10,000 feet. Level one, no departure. Radar contact. Clear to resume on navigation. Clear for on navigation. Level one. All right. Let's climb to Angel 10. Speed up and maintain 220 and. Alright, Kermit, on the way to Moffat, let's go over One, climate angels 1-0, maintaining 2-2-0 indicated. Navigation systems and how you use them for, wait for it, navigation. As you probably noticed, there are quite a few. <laughs> A-firm. The left panel looks similar, engine controls too. But almost everything else in the cockpit, including the stick, is different. It took quite some time in the sim to get a handle on that. Yeah, about that stick, which is taken from the Viper, by the way. It's going to be imperative to the course of this training to learn HOTAS in such a way that when I say TMS up short, or pinky switch, pinky switch center, as I was, your fingers do what they need to do instinctively. So you're going to need to be very proficient in your switchology in the Charlie. The HOTAS is a force multiplier if you can use it without having to stop too much and think about what you need to do. If you have to think on every button press or where the boat switch is, you're going to get behind the jet. I asked during the briefing to include the schematics in your kneeboard for reference, so if you're unsure, just use that, okay? Thanks. If I need it, I'll flip over to it. So, where do we start on the nav? Cool. And with that, I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, back to the task at hand. We will quickly go through the main instruments and panels used for navigation. We'll start with the navigation mode select panel, or NMS. Talk about the HSI, JDI, and then turn to the right console and talk about the Auxiliary Avionics Panel, or AAP. We will also cover the basics of the autopilot and HUD today and focus in a bit more on the details tomorrow. Ready? I'm all ears. Alright, so first the NMSP, which you'll find behind the aforementioned stick and just below the HSI but above the physical control panel which should look familiar, by the way, as it didn't change from the A model. Here you will choose the primary source used for your navigation. Your two sources are HARS, also known as Heading and Altitude Reference System, or the ICI, the GPS INS Navigation System. You can also quickly switch between the different points you will want to use as your destination or reference, such as Steer Point, Anchor Point, TACAN, or ILS. Good so far? Yeah, we had something similar in the A-10A. Okay, gotcha. So the HSI, or Heading Selector Indicator, is located just above it, and I guess it didn't change that much. I'd say this is one of the most useful instruments, and it has a lot of features, which will make your life easier, both during flying from point A to B, and during combat. We'll be returning to it in quite a few forthcoming sorties. Ready to move on? A firm. I saw quite a few new cool features in the sim. Good, I'm sure you'll love them. Okay, moving back up, you'll find the ADI, or Attitude Directional Indicator. This is your artificial horizon and will be very useful for your ILS landings, amongst other things. Raj. On to the right console. Obviously, the most important piece of navigation equipment we have over here is going to be the CDU 
one of the more advanced and complex pieces of equipment we have in the Charlie. Did you take your time and go through the descriptions of all the pages and functions? Yeah, I read all of it. Really, no shit. Well, during a normal sort, you will be using less than 10% of it, but it's good that you did it, and you should do it at least once. There are true jewels hidden between all the bit and test pages, which we'll come back to that. Okay, so just below the CDU, you will find the AAP, where you will power up the CDU and Iggy. The two dials below are handy for quickly displaying CDU info about your steer point, waypoint, or current position, and for determining whether you will be using the waypoint database for your flight plan, mark points, or all of it. Take a look at these. Okay, sounds easy enough. Warning, autopilot. Find yourself sitting alert in 
Roger in the AOR. Rog, I'll try, but you may have to remind me to remind you. <laughs> okay, sounds fair. Uh, now on to the NMSP. Think of our four lower buttons as a way to tell your jet which reference you should be using for navigation. The most obvious and most commonly used one would be the steer point button, which you'll find as the first one on the left. When selected, the button will have an illuminated green triangle, and the thick arrow on the HSI will be pointing towards your currently selected steer point, and the CDI will show your deviation from the chosen course. You good so far? Yeah, easy peasy. Alright, the next one is your anchor point button. Again, when selected, you'll see the green illuminated triangle. The anchor point, which most commonly is going to be bullseye, which will be used as a reference for your navigation, making it the current steer point. Remember, you can set any waypoint or march point as the anchor. Any questions? Yeah, why would I want to change anchor point from bullseye to another waypoint? Imagine you're working with ground troops and you want to be able to quickly locate targets called by them. You may want to set their position as an anchor point. Or you're working with assets from other countries that don't normally use MGR escorts. Say, for example, some French jets or maybe helicopters. Then you want to choose a waypoint that is common for both of you as the anchor point. You want more examples? Nope, we can move on. Okay, the following two buttons are mutually exclusive as they both use the CDI and range indicator on the HSI. The first one will make the thin bearing needle, also known as the bearing pointer 1, point to the tack end station that you have tuned into on the tack end panel. The second one will show you the glide slope information for the ILS localizer on the ADI. Okay. Alright, let's tune our tack end into Groom Lake at this time. So, using the channel select knobs for the tack end, now choose 1 8 X ray. After you have done that, go ahead and check how pressing the tack end button will change the way in which your HSI and HUD behave. There is no point in doing the same for ILS as we're too far away from any airport. But uh, once you're good to go, press the steer point button again, and let me know when we can move on. All right, I'm ready. Okay, cool. We only have a few things left that we need to cover on the NMSB, so there's a switch called the PTR switch. It's in the middle of the panel, and this will stow or enable the yellow pitch bank steering bars and the course warning flag on the ADI. There are also two lights on the right of the panel. They are for indicating the activation of the UHF and FM radio's homing function, respectively. Features make your radios an additional source of navigation by homing in on the signal transmitted on whatever frequency you have dialed in. This is a handy feature which is most commonly used during CSAR missions. Anything else on the NMSP or can we move on? Yeah, okay. what about the tizzle about button? that one? So tizzle, well we don't use it anymore. It's tied in with the paved penny pod but we use the TGP for finding laser illumination which, of course, renders Pavepenny redundant. So if Pavepenny has no purpose anymore, why are we still flying around with the pod and pylon on the jet? Hell, I don't know. Maybe someone thinks it looks cool. Raj? Another thing which I should have mentioned earlier is the difference between a waypoint and a steer point. So the CDU can store up to 2,050 waypoints, but unless one of them is selected as your steer point, 
no steering or navigational data will be displayed in your HUD, TAD, or HSI. So in a nutshell, the steer point is the waypoint or mark point you currently have selected, making it your destination. Make sense? Absolutely. Okay, another new feature for the Charlie is autopilot. Actually, we should have covered it in the beginning as it's very handy for you to fly straight and check all your instruments as I describe them, but it seems you've already figured it out. Actually, we had it on the Alpha. What? The autopilot. Lasty was introduced on later versions of the A-10A. Roger. Anyhow, it's on my list, so we need to go through it. So fireworks here, it's as simple as it gets. The autopilot switch is located just below the throttle set on the lacy control panel and has three basic functions that will enable you to keep your current altitude heading for both. Let's go through the autopilot's three functions one by one. Ready? Can't wait. So starting with the basic mode, which you're going to find pretty useful for cruising, we need to make sure that we're flying straight and level or pretty near it. Then we'll put the autopilot switch in the middle position, marked ALT HDG for altitude and heading hold, and press the button marked Engage and Disengage located just to the left of it. You can also use the button on the left throttle. And one last thing before I forget, you should make sure that the jet is pretty well trimmed out before you set the autopilot. If you're too far out of trim, it will make the autopilot disco, which is a bit annoying. And with that, go ahead and engage the autopilot and let me know once you got her on. Autopilot is engaged. You'll see the indication that the autopilot is on on the left side of the HUD and you should get the chime in the helmet indicating that your autopilot is engaged. This mode is useful for cruising, especially if you fly in the lead position or are in route formation. It should go without saying, but never use any autopilot mode when flying in close formation as a wingman. Great! On to the second mode. Place the autopilot switch in the forward position, marked PATH. Done. Cool. Notice that the autopilot has not reacted to being put into PATH hold. Flipping the mode switch while keeping the autopilot engaged does nothing. It will stay in whatever mode the switch was in when you engaged it. Now disengage the autopilot by pressing either button. After that, while keeping your wings level, pitch your nose up and give me a five degree climb. Once we're in that climb, re-engage the autopilot. Okay, done that. Five degree climb and autopilot is back on. Good. This mode will hold the desired path or heading while allowing you to put the aircraft into a climb or descent. Path hold will not hold bank. It does not like roll, so always make sure that the aircraft is well trimmed. Okay, let me know when you want to move on to the third and final mode. is ready. Right on. This time we're going to force the autopilot to disengage without hitting any buttons. I want you to gently but firmly push the nose over and you should feel the autopilot try to right the aircraft initially. Then it gives up and kicks off. You should hear Betty say, warning, autopilot. Do that now. Warning, autopilot. Okay, it disconnected. Perfect. So as you can see, you can add in small, minute, manual control inputs while autopilot is engaged. But anything much more than that in the autopilot will disco. Now this is handy if you need to make quick, split-second reactionary maneuvers. Then you don't have to think about and take the time to hit a button to disconnect the autopilot. Huh, imagine that. Sweet, get back to and trim for level flight, push 
the autopilot switch in the aft position, marked ALT, and enter a 15 degree left turn. Retrim and then turn the autopilot back on and let me know when that's done. I know this is a lot and it's pretty dry. 
Alright, back to it. So the shorter one always points to the currently selected steer point. The longer one will point towards the selected TACAN or UHF station. Now both needles are stowed together if you have neither of these set. Don't turn your plane just yet, but cycle to waypoint 3, please. You can do that by making your hub soy and pressing DMS up once, or using the steer point rocker switch on your up front controller or the UFC. Once you've done that, observe the movement of the thick arrow, then switch to waypoint 4, and finally go back to 3. Let me know when you've done that. It behaves in a similar manner as it did on the A model. Yeah, it's pretty standard, but it really shines when you use it in combination with the CDU. Before we move on, let's turn towards waypoint 3 before we get to Canada, eh? Devil 1's on the new course. Ready to continue. Good. You will see that the bearing needle points directly towards waypoint 3. However, the middle part of the arrow is way to the left. This is the course deviation indicator, which tells you how closely you are following the desired course. Since we turned long before reaching waypoint 2, we are left of the desired flight path, hence the CPI is to the right from the bearing needle. Don't worry about it too much as we'll cover it in detail tomorrow. Actually, it may be that your CDI is all the way to the right. If that's the case, just switch your waypoint back to 2 and then return to waypoint 3. Now the CDI should be on the correct side. This is all connected with the waypoint attributes and as I've said, this is for tomorrow's training. Uh, where was I? Ah uh, yes, the two dots to the left and the right are used how far away from the desired course you currently are, and the scale can be set in the waypoint to trip. Now on to the two knobs below the HSI. The left one is called the heading set knob, and it moves a heading marker around the compass. The marker looks like two closely set white squares. You can use it to mark a number of things like the wind direction or desired attack heading. It's not connected to any other instruments and has to be set manually. Go ahead and check it now, let me know when you're ready to move on. seems quite handy. The second knob is the course set knob, right? Correct. It allows you to set the selected course in the window on the top right and move the course arrow around the compass card. You'll want to use it when setting up for landing or if you want to arrive at a specific waypoint coming from a certain direction, which we will cover and talk about when we get to the waypoint attribute. Copy that. And the numeric window on the top left is the range indicator. A firm given a nautical mile. So the last thing we need.
need to cover here are the two small triangles just next to the aircraft symbol and along the intended course line. They indicate the course the aircraft will fly to or away from the selected attack end station or steer point. Ready for the next part? Yes, two is good to go. All right, man. So now that we've got some of the things up front figured out, let's move over to the right console and dip into the CDU, starting with the AAP panel, which controls it. Sounds good. All right, so let's move over to the AAP panel now, which you're going to find just below the CDU. We'll start with the knob on the right, known as the page select dial. By default, it should be set to the other position, data input into the CDU, while the other three positions are for read only. These selections will allow minor changes to what is displayed, but you would be unable to edit anything. So the important thing to remember here is, if you want to change any waypoint settings or attributes, this knob has to be in the other position. Copy? Yep. Other for display and the rest is for data editing. Got it. Whoa, let's back it up there, high speed. Other is for editing, and all the remaining selections are for display. You had it backwards. Sorry about that. I copied all, but my mouth is quicker than my brain sometimes. Well, so long as we got it now. Okay, so now let's go ahead and check the position and steer settings using the page select rotary dial. In the position setting, you'll see a lot of useful information displayed on the CDU and CDU repeater if you have it pulled up on an MFCD. Position will display your current location in both lat long and MGRS. Your speed, magnetic variation, altitude, and outside air temperature. You can cycle between indicated true and ground speed here as well as Celsius and Fahrenheit for the temperature. Any questions at this stage? Yeah, could you tell me a bit more about the MGRS? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. I'm guessing you don't use it too much in the civilian side, so you may have gotten a little bit rusty on that front. I'll actually take this opportunity and we'll go over two systems, UTM and MGRS. So UTM is a grid square 100 by 100 kilometers across and consists of a number from 1 to 60 and a letter. It wasn't precise enough for our needs, though, so MGRS was introduced. The way MGRS works is pretty straightforward. The first set of digits determines how far the chosen point is to the east from the southwestern corner of the UTM grid square. The second set is how far north it is. So a full 10 digit coordinate has one meter precision. Now that's close enough to confidently put a JDAM on target without ever having seen it. Pretty cool, eh? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thanks for the explanation. So magnetic variation is around 12 degrees in these parts? Hey firm, I realize you probably already know all of this, but since you asked, I'll go over it anyway. So magnetic variation is the difference between magnetic north, or the direction a magnetic compass needle points to, and true north, which is the direction along the meridian towards the north pole. If it's east from true north, then it is positive, and if it is west, then the deviation is negative. So you'll notice on some missions, other assets will give you bullseye calls using true north rather than magnetic. When this happens, you'll have to add or subtract the variation from the given heading in order to create an offset point. I'd appreciate going through differences between ground, true, and indicated speed once again. Okay, so in order to fully explain this, we first need to do some math with lots of brackets and square roots, but I'll try to do this in a simplified way. Indicated airspeed, or IAS, is the speed reading 
uncorrected for instrument position and other errors. Basically, it's your pitot tube reading and it's usually calibrated to reflect the pressure at sea level. Now, true airspeed is the actual speed of air going over the wings of the aircraft. Now, in order to get it, you take your indicated airspeed and add corrections for position error, instrument error, compressibility error, and density error. Finally, ground speed is your speed in relation to the ground and not the air. You get it by taking true airspeed and adding or subtracting the wind speed. Note that ground speed will be the only common reading for planes traveling at different altitudes. So if you want to synchronize your speed with other assets, use ground speed for that. Lastly, and most importantly, we use indicated airspeed for all of our performance data. So our takeoff, landing, stall, and all of your other speeds will be in terms of indicated airspeed. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Ready to move on. All right, staying on the AAP, the steer setting will give you all of the important information about your current steer point. The image in the left column shows the image or desired magnetic heading, which is wind correct. Below that, you will find the distance, elevation, and bearing to the steer point, which can also be changed to show the radial from the steer point on which you currently fly. Got it. The right column shows time to go and desired time on target. The second option is especially useful if you want to coordinate with other assets plan on practicing it in one of the coming sorties. If you set up a desired time on target, you will also be shown a speed required to arrive at exactly the specified time. Finally, you can see the current wind strength and direction. Have a look at it and let me know when you're ready to move on. Okay, ready to move on. Now on to the Waypoint Info page. Go ahead and switch your AAP page select switch to this position and let me know when you're there. Done. So this is a handy way to display the magnetic heading, distance, and time to go to three different points. The top right will show that information for the currently set waypoint. The bottom right is for the anchor point, while the bottom left gives you information about the steer point. The lines on the left side allow you to select the waypoint or mark point by either entering its number or letter or by using the scratch pad to type in the name. And that's all for the right knob. When you're ready, let me know and we'll move on to the steer point dial. Okay, good to go. Okay, now we will briefly cover the flight plan fundamentals. So take a look at the left selector knob on the AAP. This is known as the steer point dial, and it should be in the flight plan position. In this mode, you will see the whole flight plan displayed on the tab, with waypoints connected by a green line. Lines connecting waypoints together are known as waypoint lines for some weird reason. You may need to decrease the scale of your CAD or zoom out to see the entire flight plan. Now, in order to do so, you first have to make it soy by long pressing the coolie hat on your throttle to the left or right, depending on which MFCDE is currently displaying the CAD. Or you can soy the CAD by pressing whichever OSB corresponds to where it says CAD. After you have the TAD set as SOY, then press down on the data management switch, or DMS down, on the stick to increase the range and zoom out. Conversely, pressing up will decrease the range. So I'd like you to now move the zoom out on the TAD until you can see your flight plan in its entirety, and give me a heads up when you're caught up. Okay. 
I've decreased the scale of the TAD to the point that I can see my entire flight plan. Right on. The CDU will default into automatic flight plan sequencing. In this mode, the waypoints will automatically switch to the next one once you pass the previous one. There are applications where this is not desirable, and we'll go over them later on. Following so far? Yeah. If I'm tracking, and as I understand it, in this mode, the TAD will only display waypoints that are part of the flight plan, right? Even if I have more waypoints stored in the CDU? Exactly. Remember that the system can store up to 2,050 waypoints with those numbered 1 through 50 called mission waypoints. The rest, numbering 51 through 2,050, are called navigation waypoints. You will notice that part of the navigation waypoints are already assigned to airfields and cannot be edited, but we'll get back to that on tomorrow's sortie. On top of all that, we also have our mark points, which are labeled with letters. These will go from A to Z, while allowing you to use 25 of the available 26 letters. Oh, and one more thing to remember, that when in flight plan mode, you will only be able to move through the waypoints which are part of the flight plan. So you won't be able to set anything that is not in the flight plan as your steer point. Why can't you use all 26? I didn't catch that. One more time, please. Yeah, why can we use only 25 out of 26? I guess that I should have said you can only add up to 25 mark points manually. Mark point Zulu is set automatically as a marker for the site of your last weapons employment. Mark point Z is a very handy thing, but that is a lesson for another day. Okay, copy that. Now, if you want to display mark points, you're going to need that left selector knob in the middle position labeled, you guessed it, mark. You should not have any mark points stored in the system at this point, but we'll cover their use on another sortie, as they are mostly used for marking targets. Alright, got it. The third position is marked mission, and it will give you access to your entire waypoint database. Go ahead and move the switch into the mission position now, please. Done. Good. Take a look at your TAD. You'll see that the green lines have disappeared and all of the mission waypoints are shown. Now, we haven't added any additional waypoints to those that were part of your original flight plan, so the total number remains the same. As you can see, the navigation waypoints are not displayed in this mode, but you can cycle through them. There are many ways to do that, but we will use the remaining button on the AAP, which we have not covered so far, the steer toggle switch. By pressing it up and down, you can change your selected steer point. Go ahead and cycle it up until you see Nellis, which is waypoint 51. Set us my steer point now. Word. To wrap up today's training sortie, let's talk about the HUD. Before we do that, though, let's turn back towards Sally. So pull up and turn towards waypoint four. Return to Angels Ten, and let's try and keep two seven zero indicated, please. Warning, autopilot.
2 is on course for MOPA and at Angels 10. Let's talk about those HUD things. Fair enough. So I left this lesson for the end. I don't think there's a big difference between the HUD and the Alpha and Charlie, so we can go over it pretty quickly. Still, I have to go through the parts important for navigation just to be sure no stones are left unturned. So when you're ready, let's do it. Yes, two is ready. Alright, here we go. First, let's talk about the total velocity vector, or TVV, which looks like a circle with three lines extending outwards. It shows the aircraft's inertial velocity vector, or, using English, the point towards which the aircraft is heading, hence its other name, flight path marker. Copy. I'm aware of both names for it. Good deal. Then you probably already also know that in windy conditions, and especially with a high crosswind component, the TBV may skew to one side of the HUD. This is completely normal, and it tells you that the plane is not going in the direction which the nose is pointing. Yeah, copy. Okay, the flight path ladder and heading tape do not need any further explanation. On the left you can see your airspeed, which depending on the settings can be displayed as indicated. Ground speed indicated by a letter G, or true airspeed, which will have a letter T displayed next to it. Now, on the right side of the HUD, you'll see the barometric altitude in feet. In nav and air-to-air -air mode, it will also show you the uncorrected CACD reading. In CCIP and CCRP modes, it will be corrected for installation errors, non-standard temperatures, and non-standard pressures, and may be different to what the cockpit altimeter shows. Below it, you'll find a flight path angle, which shows you the rate of descent or ascent in degrees. Further below that, you'll find the radar altimeter, which shows the exact altitude over the ground up to 5,000 feet. If you are higher, it will just display four X's. Any questions? You said that you can change between displaying indicated, true, and ground speed on the HUD. How do you do that? Shit, I should have shown that to you on the ground during startup. First, you have to put the IPSI switch into the test position. You'll see a number of different menu items showing up on your HUD. Using the select rocker on the UFC, move the arrow to the display mode line, and once you're there, press enter. The airspeed option lets you choose between true, ground, indicated airspeed, and mock indicated airspeed. In this last mode, you'll also see the mock number next to the speed readout. You change the options using the data rocker switch. So once you're happy, you just switch the FC back into the on position. We will cover that in depth tomorrow. You mentioned different master modes. How do you switch between those? Okay. When the FC switch is set to the on position, you can cycle through the five different master HUD modes using the master mode control button on the stick. These are nav for navigation, guns, CCIP and CCRP release modes, and finally, air to air. The last one is enabled when you hold the button for a few seconds. No questions. Ready to move on. Okay. With speed and altitude covered, we need to move on. Make sure you're in nav mode if you would, please. Your steer point is shown as a small square on your HUD. You'll also notice that there is a line extending from the TVB towards it. If the steer point is outside of the HUD field of view, the designation cue will change. Go ahead and turn 90 degrees to the left and observe the marking on your HUD. And let me know what you can see.
steer point square now has a number above and below it, and it's just sitting on the side of the HUD. And the line coming out of the box is now attached to the TVV. Yep. Okay, that line is pointing in the direction towards the steer point off of the TVV. This line is known as the C line. It is worth noting that the C line is not exclusive to the TVV and steer point, but that's a lesson for another time. Okay, so the box that is nailed to the side of the HUD is showing you which side of the jet the steer point is on. The number at the top is how many degrees off that side the steer point is, and the bottom number represents how many miles you are away from that steer point. So for instance, that box was on the right side of my HUD and had a 120 on top and 13 below, I'd know that the steer point is off my 4 o'clock and 13 miles behind me. Okay, return to course now please and let me know when we can. Two's on course. Good. On to the final part. So some more information can be found in the bottom right corner of the HUD pertaining to our steer point. And that's going to be just below the radar altimeter. The first line shows the steer point number and ID. As I've told you before, numbers from 1 to 50 are reserved for mission waypoints. 51 to 2050 are for navigation waypoints. And letters A to Z are for mark points. And the ID is going to be whatever you've named that waypoint, like Vincent, IP, or whatever, okay? Yep, copy that. The second line shows distance to steer point and target elevation. The first part is self-explanatory, the second one we'll cover in detail during weapons training, but for now, it's showing the elevation source as DTS. We can manually input our target's elevation, which will be displayed instead of DTS. All right. The third line shows you time to go and time on target delta. Time to go simply shows how long it will take you to arrive at the steer point with your current speed. Time on target delta will only work if you have set the desired time on target, which is something we're going to be covering tomorrow. Looks like tomorrow's sortie will be pretty intensive. Yes, we'll do a lot of practical exercises. On the ground, you'll build your own flight plan, and then in the air, we'll practice changing waypoint attributes, creating new waypoints and mark points, changing acre points, and using the desired time on target function. I can't wait. Just make sure you're well prepared and read all the operating manuals for navigation, okay? Yeah, copy. Okay, so last line shows the current time, but it can also be used for a time hack. Way to synchronize actions with other assets may be used in combination with desired time on target or separately. However, it's a bit counterintuitive when you use it for the first time, so let's go through the process before trying it out. Ready? Alright, I'm ready. We will do a one minute hack, so press the hack button once and type. Zero one zero zero on your keypad, then press enter on your UFC. Once you do that, press hack again to return to normal mode. The system will now remember the last value you put in, so if you press the hack button again, it will show it on the HUD and immediately start counting down in the background. In the remaining time, you should press enter. If you want to start over, press hack again. Are you following? Could you repeat the last part for me, please? We will do a one minute hack. So press the hack button once and type 0100 on your keypad. Then press enter on your UFC. Once you do that, press hack again to return to normal mode. The system will now remember the last value you put in. So if you press the hack button again, show it on the HUD and immediately start counting down.
down in the background. In the remaining time, you should press enter. If you want to start over, press hack again. Are you following? Okay, good to go. Alright, three, two, one, pack. Okay, when we get to zero, I will change the formation to trail, meaning that I'll go behind you, okay? Sounds fun. Warning, autopilot.
Warning, autopilot. Altitude, altitude.